Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you very much for joining our webinar this afternoon, uh, part of the series of um, Transport for North Talks. And this afternoon, we're looking at how can we turn our decarbonisation strategy into action? Um, that's the key thing. Lots of warm words, but, but what is the action that we need to take to really deliver? Um, I'm your chair for the afternoon. My name is Lucy Winskill and I'm chair of the North East Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, and let me just briefly introduce our four panellists that we have. Uh, mayor Jamie Driscoll, who comes from my part of the world in the North East, is the elected mayor uh, leading our North of Tyne combined authority. And then we have Professor Greg Marsden. Greg is Professor of Transport Governance and Director of Carbon 8 at the Institute for Transport Studies at Leeds University. Uh, welcome Polly, Polly Billington, Chief Executive of UK 100. And last but definitely not least, uh, our colleague from Transport for the North, uh, Peter Cole, Principal Environment and Sustainability Officer. Uh, each of the panelists is going to talk for um, five minutes. Um, it's a good generous time, but if you go over, I may, uh, I may intervene just to say a little bit about their background and what they see as the priorities about, uh, well, their work and the priorities about actions and depending decarbonisation strategy. And then we'll get into a discussion involving all four panellists. And of course, we'll be, I'll be keeping an eye out for the questions um, that I hope that you are going to post. So I would encourage everyone please to tweet as we go along on hashtag TFN uh, talks and I encourage also you all please to post your questions in the Q&A chat box and we will finish very promptly at two o'clock. Uh, I sometimes say if we still have something to say, uh, knowing some of the panellists here um, we have a wealth of experience and I know that we will um, all the panellists will have a huge amount to say, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion this afternoon. So let me hand over first, please, to Peter, Peter Cole, just to say a little bit uh, more about his background uh, and his work and what he sees as the priorities. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Lucy, and um, hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'm, I'm the Principal Environmental and Sustainability Officer at TFN. Um, I won't go into a, a full background check, but uh, effectively for the last 18 months I've been um, immersed in decarbonisation work at TFN uh, and the preparation of the decarbonisation strategy uh, particularly, and that's the last time I came to speak at a TFN talk. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we managed to push that through to a successful publication last December. Uh, but obviously today I don't really want to dwell on any of the details uh, of that strategy because today is actually about moving from strategy to action uh, and one of the actions uh, we've already commenced at TFN and I think arguably the most important in the short term is TFN's clean mobility visions work stream. So our decarbonisation strategy identified that we can't achieve our trajectory or stay within our carbon budget without reducing car vehicle mileage. And we also know that that's what needs to deliver the carbon reductions in the short term before zero emission vehicles can start doing the heavy lifting. And if we don't stick to those targets in the short term, we'll have expended our entire carbon budget for surface transport in the north by around 2030. So demand management and particularly modal shift is the priority for us. The overarching aims of the Clean Mobility Vision Workstream is to provide a robust and quantified evidence base demonstrating the benefits of reduced car usage and increased public and active travel provision. And that's for use by our local authorities to help justify those really tough, often politically charged decisions around road infrastructure and parking provision, as well as active travel um, and public transport provision. And whilst we're doing that, we'll be collecting evidence around perceptions and attitudes, which I think is really key to compiling the most effective policy packages. Because the measures that in theory can give you the biggest emissions reductions won't always be the most effective measures if you haven't considered societal readiness. And to that end, we're looking at how we can pilot and potentially more widely employ the University of Lancaster's societal readiness tool, uh, which has been developed through the Decarbonate programme. 
And the second policy area that we've started to progress actions against is low and zero emission vehicles. And one of the key priorities for stakeholders that dropped out of the public consultation on the strategy, but also in discussion with our local authorities, was electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So last year, we embarked on developing an electric vehicle charging infrastructure framework for the North. And as part of phase one, which we actually completed this January, we've built an EV charge model. And that allows us to look at where and how much charge is needed on our major road network in the North over five year increments in the future. And that phase of work also assessed the potential impact of EV charging on the electricity distribution network. And by March, we want to add additional functionality by creating an online and interactive visualization tool for use by our partners. And we've had some really positive feedback from OZEV, uh, but also the peer review process, which described it as a nationally leading piece of work. And finally, the second work stream we have around low or zero emission vehicles is to do with hydrogen. So we've been supporting Durham and Heriot Watt universities under the Network H2 banner to develop an HGV hydrogen refueling model for our strategic road corridors in the north. And that works ongoing due to conclude this month, actually. But we've also bid for funding alongside the universities and northern gas networks to extend that study to become multimodal and apply a more robust overlay in terms of supply and uh, dispense options. And if we secure that funding, which I'm pretty optimistic about that, that project will run through March and April, at which point we'll have an opportunity to, opportunity to apply for more funding to move rapidly to implementing some trial sites on the ground. And we've also been linking with Cadent and East Coast Hydrogen, uh, the program to supply some potential hub locations around Humber and Teesside, which can be worked into the East Coast Hydrogen Pipeline infrastructure. So I think it's, it's a really good example of how we need to take uh, a very uh, a systems approach. So we shouldn't be siloed. We need to work across with energy generation and, and the transmission networks and how we can move from high level strategy and demand models through to implementation on the ground quite rapidly. And then finally, we also want to take on some of the most challenging aspects of transport decarbonisation early on. So through the next financial year, we've got activities planned to increase our understanding of the infrastructure carbon within TFN's investment programme, as well as the North's share of aviation emissions and how those sources of emissions impact on our trajectory and, of course, what we can do with our partners to try and address them. I uh, realise I've just whizzed through those last few activities really quickly, but happy to pick up on them in the Q&A if needed. Well, Peter, thank you very much. There's a huge amount in there and we will have the opportunity to come back and just probe a little more. I know some people will be um, will be hanging on to your optimism about funding. That's always good to hear. And we'll, we'll come back and just perhaps test you as to whether we, we, we should travel confidently about that. But thank you. Um, more from you later, Peter. Let me hand over to Mayor Jamie Driscoll. Um, we've heard Peter talk about working with the local authorities and, and Jamie leads uh, a mayoral combined authority with three local authorities of different political persuasions in this batch, which um, always for me, working closely with, with Jamie as the North East Lab Chair, makes it a really interesting um, mix, seeing how, how that is navigated, navigated very well. So, Jamie, let me hand over to you for your five minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, that's a good introduction, you know, as, as a Metro Mayor now, but an engineer by profession, I guess I'm an, an optimist by nature, but a, a pragmatist by behaviour. Um, so my first day in office declared a climate emergency. How do we deliver the decarbonisation strategy? Let, let's take five things. One, it needs money. Because if there's no money, it isn't going to happen. Two, it needs political will to get things to coordinate. Three, it needs to skill people to do the work. Or it needs the supply chain in order that these things can actually happen. You, you know, if it's not for sale, you can't buy it. Uh, five, and perhaps more important than all of them put together, is you've got to take people with you. But these are iterative. Without the money, the political will blunts. Um, without the political will, people don't follow you. All of these things work together. And if you're talking about a supply chain, people need policy stability, otherwise it doesn't happen. So uh, in five minutes, I can't go into a lot of detail, but essentially this is a coordination problem. The, the, there's a number of decarbonisation strategies. The TFN one's um, very, very good. Where it talks about business as usual, 
it's often talking of meaning in terms of, well, we drive the cars, we just wait for technological shift and things like that. The, the way I see business as usual is actually the way we govern and organize, because the default is, if we look at energy reduction over the last 30 years across all spheres of usage, somebody invests a, a better energy saving light bulb because it saves a bit of money, and it follows that path of least resistance. The reality is that's going to take too long. We do not have that long. The challenge is too great. Um, so it's going to require governments and private sector and citizens and civil society to decide that this is important. Uh, and part of that is access to good information. Um, Peter's right, systems think is the key to this. Um, and uh, just having come from the TFN board, um, it's good to see that that is, despite the cuts that TSN facing that, that systems thinking is going to be a, a key part of it <laughs> and uh, anyone who spends any time with me knows i'm always banging on about this so we look at this from the point of view of the earth system limits you know if we talk about net zero well this idea that we can continue to maintain emissions and then somehow get them out of the atmosphere later is a false starter the energy balance for that requires so much more the cost of that energy alone to, to offset the emissions we produce today would use the entire resources of the earth's economy it's just simply not possible so net zero has to be as close to zero emissions as we can we have electric vehicles and the drive to electric vehicles but at the moment the vast majority of our electricity is produced by fossil fuels we need to fully decarbonize the grid and have the resilience uh, and grid balancing so that we've got the, the systems in place for when those days the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. Now, normally they kind of offset each other reasonably well. Um, we have to look at end of life issues. Um, electric batteries do degrade. Wind turbines do break down eventually. Um, it's the case that currently wind turbine blades are getting thrown in the landfill. Um, so these problems that we're dealing with now, we have to account for in the longer term. We need a much better planning system. Anyone who's listening to this call will, uh, when they're, they're traveling around, will see new estates going up now where there is no possibility of mass transit being available for those people because the planning just hasn't taken that adequately into account. It's dependent still on private cars and often weaving in and out of these estates on buses is damn near impossible. So the bus companies tell me, and they know. Uh, we see Highways England schemes uh, or national highways are now popping up, but I've spoken to local authority leaders who told me I found out about it in the press. Um, so the coordination just isn't there. And if we look at the private car. For to, to, let's be optimistic, let's say we're a 75 kilo person. I think I'm a bit heavier, but for me to go somewhere in a private car, I'm taking 1500 kilos of highly processed resources with me. The Earth cannot withstand that. We're going to have to get to a situation where if we are going to have private cars, there's some sort of smart sharing system um, that you share between households and the car goes and picks people up. We simply cannot afford to produce that much. Uh, and people on minimum wage, you tell them to go get a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf, they're going to say no. Um, and never mind what happens in the third world where we're not going to get a decarbonized grid. So the, the way we've got to see this is uh, the challenges to obesity. We need things like land value capture. We've got to put them into a single financial framework We've actually got to change the way we fund things. Otherwise, there is just not enough money in the system to fix this problem in the time available. Like Jamie, thank you. Absolutely on the nail as ever, Jamie. Thank you very much and, and more that we will <coughs> come back to shortly. Uh, let me now pass to Professor Greg Marston from the Institute of Transport Studies. Um, Greg, please introduce yourself and, and your five minutes perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lucy. So um, I'm leading the decarbonate network that uh, Peter referred to earlier. So we've been working with with TFN over a, a number of years on the decarbonisation challenge, but also a range of other uh, local authorities and uh, network providers and transport operators. Um, I mean, I, I, I pretty much agree with everything that everyone's said so far. You know, this is a climate crisis. We've got to take action early in the period and it is going to mean planning to travel less by car and it is going to mean making some different choices to the choices we made in the period that got us to where we are now. We won't get out of the crisis if we keep doing the same stuff that we've always done and the longer we leave it, the harder the choices will get. And I think that's part of taking society with us is to try and create that 
that sense that you know action not taking action now is going to create more problems in the future but um i promised myself this year i was going to be more positive about um what we do um rather than um always problematizing it so five things i think we should be getting on with and this is all about urgency um, so the first thing is we absolutely have to lock in some of the commute and business travel and indeed some of the shopping travel reductions we've seen from COVID-19. If we let all of that go, when will we deliver behaviour change? So I think it's an intensive programme of business engagement. It's incentives from operators to help spread demand across the week in ways that work best for the public transport network. And it's going to require some subsidy, continued subsidy from national government to support public transport as we find what the right new balance is going to look like. We can't afford any cliff edges and negative spirals of public transport use. I think um, the point Jamie made about uh, electrification is critical. I think we need to intensively plan for light electric mobility. So this could be personalised, could be two wheelers, you know, mini vehicles, um, as well as the shared systems which you have in place. At the moment, electrification, the manufacturers are pushing high vehicle range. That means lots of batteries. That means bigger cars. It's also very expensive, but it brings a better markup for the manufacturers. We need more efficient mobility. That means more car sharing, as Jamie said, and we need a stimulus on that post COVID because some people and businesses will have suspended those kinds of services. But it means lighter vehicles for shorter trips. The overwhelming majority are shorter than 35 miles in length. Light electric mobility could do a lot for us, particularly if we join it up with public transport for longer journeys. It will help tackle the cost of living crisis if we get it right. And if we don't provide lower cost forms of motoring for people in six or seven years time, we'll have half the population, well, not quite half the population, maybe 30 percent of the population paying hardly anything for what they what, how they travel. And we will have the rest of the population paying 70 pence a litre on, you know, on, on fuel. It's going to become incredibly unfair very quickly. Right, number three, reallocate road space to buses, cycles and pedestrians. We can do this quickly. It's relatively inexpensive, although it's not without its challenges politically, but they, that's something we can do quickly. Uh, if I had a magic wand, I'd have somewhere trial what they're doing in Vienna or what they were doing in Vienna, which was a 365 euro per year, all inclusive pass for public transport. You get many more people engaged in the system, so you build revenue that way. Obviously, it requires some subsidy, but that's now been rolled out across the whole of Austria. You know, are we serious about this? Is it a crisis? Are we going to try something radically different or not? I think we ought to be really pushing for, for radical trials. And my final one would be stop digging um, stuff that we know we shouldn't be doing just because it's still in the programme from, from years back. Be consistent. Too many places doing good things over here and then bad things in tandem. New cycle lanes coupled with new highways. In my local authority, York, talking about removing car parking spaces in the centre to open up a great new public space. It would be brilliant, but they're saying we're only going to do that if we can also build a multi-storey car park uh, to compensate for the loss of parking spaces. At the same time as saying we'll be zero emissions by 2030 and people will be driving less. You can't take the population with you if the actions you take are completely inconsistent. They're not idiots. You know, we, we see this stuff in front of us and we, you know, we ask ourselves, what are we being told to do? So I think our actions have to be really, really consistent. We have to challenge ourselves on all of these decisions. So I think we can't have our cake and eat it. There are some difficult choices ahead and I think we need to go on a diet. That's going to be a bit tricky. Thanks. Greg, thank you very much. And I can see from the from um, we're going to break out in violent agreement with one another. Lot, lots of nods there, um, which may be just what we need. Polly, may I hand over to you next and tell us a little more about UK 100 and your work? Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucy. Yeah, UK 100 is a network of local leaders who've made a commitment to act on clean energy, climate and clean air. So we're very much aligned to the kind of conversation that we've been having uh, today. And we have a significant number of members in the north um, uh, covering the same area that we're talking about today. Um, their ambition is high, but we also know that ability to deliver depends on a number of things. And we've done some research, particularly on the powers that local authorities have that um, understand what the limits of those powers are quite often 
partly to do with resources, but also to do with national regulation, which limits their ability to be able to do more than what they would like to. But overall, what I would say, and this backs up the kind of things that uh, Jamie um, and others have been saying, is that local leaders really need to have a significant input into shaping what their transport in the North decarbonisation plan should be, because they know the people in their areas best. They know what their ambitions are, they know what they're, how they're already moving around, what they're moving around for, how often they're doing so, and so forth. And that helps you to be able to shape and understand what you want to have as a kind of transport vision for the future, where those resistance points might be, and how you might be able to smooth them out and help people to do what they want to do more of, as well as what you want to be able to encourage them to do less of. We also think, and this is really important um, as well, particularly with me sitting here in London um, thinking about this, is that this is as much to do with combining the levelling up strategy of the government with net zero plans. If you don't combine these two things, not you won't be able to do either of them well. Um, uh, and, the, and the danger is if you do one without the other, you will have some really, really perverse incentives um, and uh, some un unintended consequences. So working with them in unity makes a real difference. And we, that, that means if you do it that way, you can make a strong case for that better investment in transport infrastructure that everybody has been talking about. I know how important franchising, cap fares, control of routes and so forth are for bus services across the UK. I know that because m most of our members are outside of London and they know that basically anybody on a living wage will spend the first hour of their shift paying for their bus to and from work. And that is significantly not the case in somewhere like London, where it is, where it is uh, considerably cheaper. Those kind of things make a difference to whether people feel able and free to be able to uh, take up work and, um, and thrive. Those things make a difference to what we therefore need. So there are some upsides to this. One is that you've actually got quite a lot of MPs in the region who are net zero transport champions on the Conservative backbenches. Uh, Simon Fell, uh, Alexander Stafford, um, Robert Larkin and so forth. So make the most of people who want to see net zero transport happen, who have got decision making influence beyond local government. Another thing to really reassure people, and I've just come off a webinar when we've been talking about some of the challenges of net zero decarbonisation of transport locally, public opposition is in the minority. Hang tough while listening, tweak, accept sometimes some things might not be right, but don't row back and concede, because ultimately the loudest voices of dissent should not be outweighing the majority and the benefits for the majority of people. We've done some, we commissioned some report, some uh, research from Ipsos Mori, where it actually shows that the, the, the significant support for these uh, activities and also some interesting demographic breakdowns. Government's got to be clear about what they want local authorities to do. They've talked about a toolkit, for the transport decarbonisation plan. We still haven't seen it. It'd be quite good to see that. And I'd like to point out a lot of this call so far has been we need to do this stuff. Mostly local authorities are in agreement things need to be done. Now we need to be talking about how it needs to be done. And what's interesting is that the transport decarbonisation plan is still basically outlining the it needs to be done, changing travel options, reducing the need to travel, influencing behaviour through charging, decarbonising the fleet. All things are expecting local authorities to do. OK, how do we do them? And that's where our findings in particular on what needs to what needs to change are really important. Devolve and pool local authority transport funding to provide longer term certainty and local authorities should be trusted to get on and to deliver. I know this will be music to the ears of people like Jamie. Integrate the powers required for local authorities to develop a London style integrated, reliable, cheaper and simpler to use regional public transport service. People should not be having to worry about the safety, security or affordability of their, bus, uh, of their buses. And this goes to one of Jamie's points about people building homes or local authorities finding themselves in a situation where they're building homes which are unconnected to um, decent transport systems. Ensure that the revisions to any planning bill promote less car dependent development, 
So developments are planned in line with the transport decarbonisation plan and new homes are integrated into the sustainable transport policy network, transport, public transport network. Lucy, I know you pointed out that the North of Tyne Authority has got different lo uh, political persuasions within those local, within those boroughs. We know we have political consensus across our network about this. People who know they have to build more homes do not want to find that they are building into car dependent communities. This is something which you can actually build a public consensus, a, a political consensus about in your area and therefore expand the case um, uh, uh, to national government. Requirement on that highways England. I know in Newcastle, those urban motorways create problems for that end up being picked up by the city council. That is not the right way that to be that to be working. So let's make sure that the regulation drives the behaviours of those national regulators, those national agencies to make a difference and develop a net zero delivery framework exactly for this purpose. Because without that, we will find that it doesn't matter how well, how ambitious local authorities are, they will come bumping up against national regulation and national uh, decisions, which are making it harder for them to be able to decarbonise their communities. I'll leave it there. Polly, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And, and my comment about the different flavours of the local authorities in, in our patch is not that one is saying we don't want to do this. Uh, I think it's more about the ability to move at the same pace uh, and the ability to find resources to move collectively. But it seems to me, Polly, you've handed the baton nicely to Jamie first to come in and just talk about that, about um, that, that, that interesting mix of local authorities, a combined authority, the push, the drive, the leadership required. Um, Jamie, can I just ask for your comments around that? No, nope, we've still got you on mute. Ah, that's interesting. I'm wondering if we're going to have a, um, I'll give you a minute or two more. Jamie, I think we've got you now. Uh, uh, great. Thank you. Um, there we go. I've never done that before. Um, yeah, the it, it is absolutely a systems thinking approach. I mean, they're probably absolutely right. This is music to my ears. Um, stability is necessary um, for just about every major change. If you look at the, you know, the the things that have had to happen fast in the past, whether it was the Second World War. It basically required everybody to say, yeah, all right, this is serious. We're going to change the rules. Um, central government handed Rolls Royce a one million pound check. And it was a check in those days and said, make us engines, get on with it. Um, and it's almost that level of you people are the experts, just go and do it. Um, but it does need to be in a national framework and it does require, uh, as Polly says, the regulations there. Otherwise, we're not going to find that the private sector developers of um, various pieces of kit, all of the things uh, that Greg was talking about, you know, um, light electric vehicle things. I've got an electric bike, it's great to get around on and it keeps me fit at the same time. But I think we also need to be looking at the, the money because the standard objection, every government, every central government certainly loves spending money, it makes them look good um, and running out of money makes them look bad. So you've always got these, these two conflicting approaches. And it requires a little bit of thinking beyond this as simple about as simply a balance sheet exercise. We spend as a country will in the in coming decades 50 billion a year on obesity, 1.65 billion a year with consequences of obesity across the, the Northeast Transport. So the money is there if we're willing to invest up front, exactly as we found with, with COVID, we pull it together and we say, yeah, this is an emergency, let's do it. So that's what I mean by political will. Um, and there are, it's very disturbing. Um, it's, it's good to hear Polly name checking the people who are on board on this, but there are also those who are using phrases, pardon the language, saying, let's get rid of the green crap um, because of I don't, whatever their motives are, I'm not going to go into that. So specifically, um, we're talking about uh, for transport for the north, a northern active travel strategy where people still have their own sovereignty in their own areas to deliver these things. But they're based on a common understanding of what works and a common set of access to, to the things that make them work quickly so that not everybody has to reinvent the wheel. Um, it's got to be the same on, on all of these things. You've got to allow people to develop in parallel but share. Um, and unless we get things like land value capture 
is a way of unlocking money. And unless we're allowed to say to Treasury, look, that 1.65 billion a year that we're going to be wasting in the North East and people having terrible health outcomes, we're going to have to bring some of that forward. You'll get the savings in a few years' time. And in the meantime, we'll decarbonise some of our uh, transport um, and there'll be an economic uplift in all of this because we all know that the ill health leads to poor economy. So it really is nailing that virtuous circle. To make that happen, I think the there is a, a strong issue of the electoral cycle, um, if, if I'm honest about it. And that's where I think subnational transport bodies like Transport for the North can really do something because it is cross party. I mean, as you say, Lucy, I would, Combined authority is, is conservative Labour, um, but transport for the North has everybody in it. Um, so it really is a plurality of thought. And when everybody came together and agreed and said, let's have land value capture, um, I think that was a breakthrough moment. I think that's the, the sort of approach to take. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Peter, I'm going to turn to you um, next. You're nodding away and I'd just like your reflections uh, in a minute just to to what you've heard so far and and are we doing enough we all of us on the call and transport for north to, to lobby the politicians and at what level is it national is it local we've talked about the sub transport boards how do we best do it and i'll bring greg and polly polly i can't see you anymore but i'm hoping that you're still there yes i am Um, yeah, so I, I guess my ref I think, as you said, we're all in sort of violent agreement, really. I think I, I think there has to be a, a, a realisation. Uh, someone of significance said that, you know, we don't need to change anything to get to where we need to go. Um, but but we do and we know that. Um, and I think perhaps, uh, you know, it, it's uh, I think Greg's uh, sort of five five point plan. There were loads of positive things that we can do in there about sort of incentivizing people to to change their behaviours. Um, but I think there also has to, and this this plays to what what um, uh, Jamie was saying that there has to be, I think, a, a fairer pricing uh, of our travel choices. And we saw the select committee for road pricing. They produced their report the other week. And there was nothing in there uh, acknowledging the the true cost of uh, driving and car transport. And, and by that, I mean the negative externalities around obesity and air quality and uh, congestion and all these sorts of things. Um, and it also made uh, a statement that, you know, any replacement to, to fuel tax needs to be the same or less. But that, and that wouldn't really be reflecting the the relative price of that travel choice. Um, so I think there's a there's a really sort of under fundamental underlying element to to this. All of these good things we do about you know increasing the convenience of public transport and active travel, it really needs to be complemented by a, a fairer pricing of our travel choices. So I think for me that is a a really key element that we have to get to grips with. Um, and of course, that needs to be dynamic enough to be able to um, be delivered in a fair way and a just way for, a, for a, a, a system which isn't going to be able to change as far, you know, overnight in terms of the people who need actually need to travel by car. Um, so I think that's uh, probably one of my sweeping statements. I'm going to just sort of lay out there um, in terms of sort of levels of governance. I think that's a really interesting one. We've had um, some some excellent uh, engagement with with DFT recently. We've been looking, working with them um, alongside, well, alongside them around their uh, local transport um, uh, local transport plan guidance and how uh, we know that uh, they're actively seeking our engagement and helping local authorities up their sort of uh, capabilities around all this. So all of the things that we're doing are designed to be used by our partners um that are meant to be useful to our partners um so for instance the clean mobility visions and also around that sort of developing some consistency around quantifying and en enabling local authorities to quantify as well because i think it is the right level for it to be done but we need to give our local authorities the, the tools to be able to quantify the emissions reductions from the particular policy recommendations they want to make um, and we need to make it consistent between 
places in our region, but places over the country. Um, and we need consistencies in the assumptions we're taking and the baselines that we're putting together. So I think um, I think that uh, there's some really, for me, some really positive signs coming from DFT around how they see that governance working. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic about that. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I want to turn, if I may, to the role of universities uh, and business collaboration in all of this. Um, so my day job as a university is to have a particular interest in that, that coming together of academia and business and local authorities. But can you just talk a, a little bit about the importance of the academic input into this debate and emerging technologies that may help us? Um. Thanks. Well, I, I suppose um, my view, view of the role of uh, academia is twofold. One, one is to provide the independent challenge, and that's something that we do with with TFN, um, both in public fora, but also, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, behind closed doors, we we test push um, the kinds of thinking that's going on. I think it's really critical that we don't hide from the science and the numbers. You know, I, I go to a lot of events where it, it, you know, people talk about what's going on and how positive things are, and it is important to celebrate the good things, but nowhere's on track. You know, when we have to have that transparency, and you know, sometimes that's that has to be said from from outside, whether it's NGOs or universities. I do think there is a role um, for the public sector more generally. You know, we're huge employers, um, and the people who work for our organisations and the people we procure from, they're all part of the, the carbon problem. They're all part of the carbon solution. So I think as, as large organisations, if you take take the health sector, local government, universities, um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot um, to, to be done with there. And then finally, obviously, you've got the role of kind of um, research and innovation. Peter talked about some of the um, the hydrogen developments. I mean, I'm not saying I, I think we know that hydrogen is the is the solution, but we know that we need to we need to find out whether it's the right way to go uh, or or whether it's electrification. There are, there are a lot of uncertainties out there. You know that the the decarbonisation plan is betting its chips on an awful lot of technology uh, coming off. And I think we need to have the analysis that's you know looks at okay how risky is this going to be. Personally, I think the messages tell us that um, you know if, if if it's my risk register, I'd be saying we've got to take action, uh, mitigation action right now, because of the risks of some of these other things not happening in the timescales or at the prices, and all the things Jamie was saying about supply chain and so on. There's just too much risk back ended in in the plan, and I think that suits national government uh, to have it that way. Greg, thank you. And I've just got half an eye on the questions that are coming in. Well, we have had a specific question around whether there should be uh, government investment in new technologies for rail transport, such as hydrogen. So um, could I just bring in the other panellists, um, uh, your reflections on that, that trying out new technology, hydrogen in particular, or is there another game in town we should be looking at? Uh, Jamie, may I bring you in first and then I'll follow up with Polly if I may. We're almost there, Jamie. Nope. But Polly is live, um, so let me hand to you while we try and get you, Jamie. Thank you. UK 100, generally speaking, is technology agnostic because we think that, there, that there's a lot of things that are already proven that we need, should, need to be prioritising. Support innovation and research in order to be able to develop more solutions, but primarily make sure that the things that we already know work are, are done at scale and commercialised so that we can do things further and faster. Um, I'm, I feel a little bit like Greg, that too much is, is often banked on something that is going to be a silver bullet in technology around the corner. I've been involved in this space since 2008 when uh, people thought that electric cars were impossible, uh, off, uh, um, wind turbines were some kind of crank venture, um, and yet also were saying what we really need is more X, which was some kind of uh, magic piece of technology which hasn't come to fruition. What I would point out about these things is that quite often the technology can be proved, no disrespect to the university people on the on the call, on the back lot of um, a university campus, but does it work in real life? 
And that's what I mean about getting it to um, pro proving it at scale um, that means that it can be deployed um, in, uh, in, um, at a cost that the that society and the economy will bear. Now, Greg is also right about the fact that we've been externalizing environmental costs for 200 years. Let's be honest about it. So almost all of the prosperity, particularly in this country, has been built on externalizing costs, which we now need to internalize. So I would say, fundamentally, I would say we've got 27 billion quid in a budget for a roads program. And we're spending three billion on active travel. I would say that is pretty much out of kilter. Yes, of course, we need to be investing in rail freight and decarbonizing that rail freight in order to be able to take dirty fossil fuel vehicles off our roads and stop demanding that um, we need to be able to build more roads. But there are lots of really boring technical issues in terms of regulation that can drive those decisions as distinct from investing in uh, in unproven technologies. And one is decouple economic growth and the idea that traffic movements uh, indicate more economic growth. That's literally what drives the 27 billion quid um, road programme is that the more cars that move around, the government assesses that is good for the economy. Even though if you design your communities better, people can go and uh, be active members and uh, active players in that economy, either by buying or selling goods and services, working and creating things without necessarily getting into a vehicle and moving around. That kind of tedious little piece of, 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 um, of technical change would make a big difference, a much bigger difference, I would argue, to driving the kind of policy changes we're looking for than particular investment in a, in a, in a particular technology. Holly, thank you. And Jamie, we think we've now we've got back in the conversation. Thank you. I'll stay unmuted if I may. <laughs> um, the Netflix film, Don't Look Up, I don't know who's seen it, um, but it pretty much nails it. They have a plan, the plan's working. And then somebody comes up with this idea, oh, we could make a load more money with this new technology and that will solve the problem even better. Um, and I'll not spoil the film, today. it's a good film, it's worth watching. Um, so we've had, gosh, you can go back to, when I was an undergraduate in 1993, I wrote a, a proposition about low carbon transport then. Um, we've had COPs, we've had the Kyoto Agreement, we've had the Paris Agreement, um, and emissions are still rising. And this technology that's supposed to take out the ground, it isn't. There's, I think there's one country in the world that's reforested, and that's Costa Rica, and that's about it. Um, so it's not going to happen uh, in the time scales that we need. Um, if you look at the engineering reports, um, it's one of them being a, a politician with, with a technical background, on something like... Um, carbon capture and storage. Um, it shows that there is a net increase over and above just burning the gas in power stations because the technology is improving. It might get there, it might get there at some point if we spend many billions of pounds on it. But exactly as Polly was saying, if we spend many billions of pounds just actually moving people back around a bit better, a bit more cheaply, in a more healthy way, in a more sensible way so that people aren't driving 30 miles to get to work when we can do a digital commute when we can just organize ourselves better all of these sorts of things um that's the role so technology um advances many things advances productivity um it has yet actually to make that much of a difference in bending our climate uh, we're talking about transport but if we bring in something like retrofit the technology involved in that is pretty simple you know in some cases, it's wool that we've been using as a civilization for many thousands of years, you know, putting on a jumper. Um, so all of these things make a difference. Um, if we pin our hopes on technology, we'll fail. Jamie, thank you. Uh, again, with an eye on the questions, I'm going to come back in a minute towards the end about walking more, cycling, sharing cars, things that, that we as individuals can all do. But we've got an interesting question here. It's specifically about Liverpool Airport, but it could relate to uh, all of our airports in, in all of our regions. And I think really Stephanie's question there is about the tension between the need or, or the desire by some to expand uh, aviation and the aviation routes, the health hazards to that, the cost of the environment and so on. 
Um, and just some reflections. We haven't really talked about air travel a lot in, well, at all at this debate um, today, but generally I think it's perhaps a little overlooked. Peter, are you able to say something about um, TFN and um, your thinking about airports, airports expansions? And Greg will come to you next, thanks. So um, I, I mentioned earlier that we were, we, we have planned for this year um, to uh, create a version of our carbon baselines, including the emissions from av aviation in the north. Um, and I, I think what we'll see is is a relatively large policy gap then created between our, our, our baselines and our uh, trajectory. And it, it sort of becomes incumbent upon us then, I think, to look at how we can reduce it. And we've just started, uh, if you like, that process and we've recruited, uh, coming back to the role of academics, we've actually recruited a couple of academics to provide us with some independent advice around that and, and to advise help advise our board and our partners on that. But um, obviously it's it's a very politically thorny issue. And I think there's there's one uh, really big thing from our point of view is that, you know, this, this has to be a national endeavor. Um, we can't um, uh, we can't constrain one airport in one region and not in the others. Um, we're going to be looking at, at leakage at, at, of, of passengers at best. Um, but obviously that creates a competitive disadvantage. So I think, you know, there is a massive um, onus on on national government to uh, develop further policy around this. And we know the Jet Zero strategy, just the projections there are, are founded on a, a, a effectively a te technological fix. Um, and they're all sort of um, ambitious scenarios with breakthroughs. Uh, and whether those breakthroughs come, we don't know. So I think uh, our, our position on it really is that um, you do need to have a plan B. What happens if those breakthroughs don't come? What? How are you going to, um, it's not reduce the demand, but re reduce the uh, projected increase in demand in the future. I think there needs to be a well thought out plan B. Um, but as I said, uh, Lucy, we're, we're just starting on that piece of work. So I don't want to preempt it too much or where it where it might go with partners. Um, well, we'll pick that up as you develop that work. Thank you, Peter. And Greg, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I mean, in many respects, this one's actually pretty easy. People are going to have to fly less. And when I say that, I don't actually mean everyone's going to have to fly less because half the population don't make any flights whatsoever. So some recent statistics from some work by uh, my colleagues uh, in the CREDS Research Centre, 3% of all trips I think this is UK trips are um, flights. It's 60% of all miles that we travel, counting sort of national, international travel, and it's 70% of the carbon. Okay, so it's the it's the small number of the population who are flying very regularly or flying long distances that are generating a lot of the aviation carbon. So if we want to have discussions about how difficult and fair the low carbon transition is going to be and we want to continue to invest in expanding airports then once again that is a very obvious fault line that anyone on the street would be uh, able to engage with so we should be lobbying for a frequent flyer tax you know we it's not that people can't fly uh, in a in, in in a future but it's going to have to be flying less. And you talked about the role of universities. Well, Leeds is trying to commit to uh, reducing the amount of uh, staff uh, flying movement. It's still got to address uh, student flights and so on. But, you know, th there's there's an awful lot of work to be done with all of the, the, the businesses in that, you know, <laughs> this all counts towards carbon and we've got to find the right the right balance. But, you know, if, uh, the numbers are obvious when you look at aviation. You can do an awful lot of individual behaviour change. But then if you take two flights a year, <laughs> you've just put it somewhere else. The planet doesn't care whether you did it in a plane or didn't do it in your car. You know, it 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 matters. Peter, thank you. Uh, I know I'm going to be accused of jumping around here, but we've got some brilliant questions here and, and they're coming on different themes. I'm going to pick up one that's specific for Polly. Uh, and Polly, I'm not sure if you can see this, but the question is around the forthcoming May local elections, um, where it's recognised that local parties and candidates will base their local campaign around strongly and emotionally objecting to changes 
um, to provision and conditions for car drivers. And the question really is about the cross-party umbrella group like yours working together to, to call out this sort of behaviour and campaigning. Can you just respond to that, please? Yes, uh, we're aware that some people will, some people who have implemented really ambitious uh, low traffic measures are worried about the electoral impacts of doing that, partly because there is a small, very vocal m minority who um, uh, disproportionately take up um, the amount of media, particularly social media space. Um, and energy of politicians having to deal with them. And in reality, and I've, I've got our um, Ipsos Mori uh, polling in front of me, we commissioned Ipsos Mori, Mori to look at public um, attitudes towards transport interventions. More than 50% either strongly support or tend to support the banning of manufacturers from selling polluting vehicles, introducing grants for businesses and people to buy low carbon vehicles, policies to encourage people to work from home more often where possible, policies to encourage people to switch to electric car, um, car motor, uh, electric motors in cars, and introducing clean air zones. More than 50% on all of those things, and the opposition quite substantially smaller. So be aware that just because somebody is filling your inbox, or indeed shouting in your face when you're out door knocking, does not mean they represent enough people for you to stop doing this. You are cleaning up the air, you are making the lungs of your children and your older people healthier, you are reducing the burden on the NHS, you are making people's lives better. Tweak, learn what goes right, learn what goes wrong, but for goodness sake, do not think that this is the end of your political career when actually what it is, is a legacy for your communities. It is absolutely the right thing to do. It's hard. It needs to be done sensitively. You need to think about accepting that you might need to change things a little bit, but it doesn't mean you should say, you know what, lots of people were really horrible to me, so therefore I'm going to stop. Jamie, I'm going to bring you in because I'm, I'm, you are a lovely man. I work very closely with you, but I'm sure that people were very horrible to you as you have gone around um, in the various elections that you've put yourself forward to. Uh, can you just talk about you know, the, the person on the street and the, and the reaction that yeah. Polly's talked about? Um, surprisingly, people are very rarely nasty to me. I'm not sure why it is. Uh, it might be something to do with the black belt of jiu-jitsu. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But um, Polly's absolutely right. There's already on this call, um, we've had somebody say, introducing something which is a, uh, a well researched fact, and introducing it by saying, I know this is politically contentious, but it's okay to tell the truth. Check your facts, but tell the truth. You don't have to say, um, you know, anything of the sort of policy measures we've been talking about on this call, you don't have to say vote Jamie because blah, 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 blah. You just have to say, no, it is the case that if we're going to have uh, a net zero strategy delivered, we're going to have to drive less. And all of the sort of policy recommendations that people are saying. Um, the other slightly thing I would say is for anybody watching, I can't see the questions not coming up, um, is that in the time we did a citizen assembly on climate change and it was remarkable. And this is a truly representative sample of people from all across North Italia, from farmers in Northumberland to young people in the city centre. Um, and they um, they decided their own questions, they asked for their own experts to come in, we did not programme this in any way. And then when they heard the evidence, they weighed it up, they came up with a set of policy recommendations and they were indistinguishable for what I would have come up with myself. So the, we can rely on the facts the the great british public and and presumably the world public internationally when they see the evidence they tend to make evidence-based decisions um so have the confidence in this thank you um thank you. With drawing to an end um i want to turn back in a minute to ask you all about um actions that we as individuals should be taking and if you were to prioritize what what they would be but before i do so um let me ask each of you, if, if you had to nail your, color, nail your colours to one policy, just the one to prioritise, can you just share what it would, what that would be? And I, I'll go in this order to, to Greg, to Peter, to Polly and then to Jamie on this. So 
and Greg, the policy that will make the difference. We have to address how we're going to pay for how we travel, because in, as I said, in seven, eight years time, fuel duty will be the most unfair tax in the country. And if we don't address it, how are we going to get more people on public transport when driving gets cheaper and cheaper? The whole thing will fall down. And Peter, if I turn to you. I'm afraid it's it's the same. Um, it's the fairer, fairer pricing of our, our travel choices and using what what needs to be an overhaul to de to deliver on those those object decarbonisation objectives, but those wider health and, and economic benefits from that too. And Polly? I would go I would go for buses, right? What you need is control of fares and routes locally for buses. Ultimately, far too much of our conversations about transport nationally are as though everybody spends their time going on intercity trains um, and that's where all the all of it is about. And most people get to and from work on the buses. And if they are spending their time in a knackered old dirty jalopy, it's because the buses aren't good enough. That's literally the case. And I know that's the case in the Northeast. I've been the person who had to buy a dirty knackered old jalopy in order to be able to drive around and do my job living in the Northeast. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. We have to be able to feel confident that those buses are affordable, safe, secure and clean. Thank you. And Jamie, have you disposed of your dirty old jalopy? I think you have. Yes, yes. I have uh, um, a, a lovely, shiny electric bike that keeps me fit as well, um, which very similar position to, to other speakers. It's the money. Uh, the policy that I would want is to start looking at this as a systems accountancy basis. Um, if we take into account all of the damage done from ill health, obesity, all of the things that, that congestion, all of those externalities, and we're allowed to fund a transport system like that, you know, it costs £4,600 a year to own and run a car. Yeah, imagine what we could do if we had that in a transport system we could we'd almost pay people to get on the bus couldn't we um so that's the sort of approach we need and it's it's you know the accountants will save us on this it's not going to be technology it's going to be accountancy how do you address um the inadequacy of the public transport in the rural area um, your patch covers vast bits of northumberland um, just uh, this is really for all the panel re reflecting is that is there a divide between the rural and the city and, and how do we address those inequalities if you see them in that way yes yeah can I just can I just uh, jump in because we've done quite a lot of work on this because our members uh, cover both um, both parts both sort of uh, communities you might not have the same kind of public transport um, solution in uh, in both places and what we find is that people who have run big rural areas will say well rural communities will say well we can't possibly do what you're talking about in terms of buses but other places are looking at demand uh, demand uh, on demand public transport they're looking at EV car clubs based in small villages so you can get from one town to another um, uh, charge you, um, put your car on charge and go back those kind of things as well uh, are definitely possible we need to make sure that you've got government policy thinking about that so it's workable at different scales across the urban rural spectrum so that no area is disadvantaged I'm just, I, I, you know, it's useful to think about the fact that Jamie Fell is a, an MP in Cumbria and he is a net zero transport champion for active travel, right? So he is not going to find those things easy in his community, as distinct from somebody who might represent somewhere in London, but he's doing it. Why? Because he knows that active travel has other benefits as well. And we need to be thinking not only about public transport, but how we connect up uh, public transport and active travel into something that really works in all communities. Thank you. Jamie, you were going to come in uh, and then I will very shortly close um, our session down. I was going to say there's a gradient, but there's not an urban rural divide. Um, it's, you know, if you live right in the city centre, you might be able to walk everywhere and, 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 and no vehicle and never even use a bus, perhaps. And if you're in like an isolated farmstead, but a lot of our rural areas, people are still coming in and out of towns uh, and cities. Um, and getting their, their groceries by driving to the supermarket. So it's the sort of solutions that Polly's talking about there. Um, there's there's no need to be having double-decker buses going between villages. It doesn't help anybody. 
Um, but what it absolutely needs is the coordination issue. So if we think there's a coordination issue with buses in cities, there's a huge one in local areas. And this is where if you leave it to bus companies, they will say we're going to only run the profitable services. There are very few of them and it needs cross subsidy. Forgive me, panellists, and forgive me, everyone who is watching this. We are now out of time, and I didn't get to the, the things that we as individuals can do immediately, and that maybe will come back for another webinar. Um, particular apologies, we have something like 32 questions, and Peter, I'm going to charge you with going away and looking at all of those and carrying on the thinking um, uh, that you're doing at Transport for North, supporting all of our work and working with us in partnership. So thank you. To, to conclude, can I encourage everyone to sign up for the TFN newsletter for um, to hear about future events? Uh, and if you want to read more about our work, it's transportfornorth.com forward slash decarbonisation. Very finally, um, Greg, Peter, Jamie, Polly, thank you so much for giving up uh, an hour this afternoon. I've really enjoyed the discussion and I don't feel I'm an expert on this, but I feel very much better informed. Thank you for your insights and your contribution. and. Um, um, we'll sign out now. Thanks all.